Um, I'm delighted to be here. Good morning, everybody. So, I mean, to, to do, when I get up at 5 o'clock in the morning, my body says one of two things. I'm either getting ready to go fishing or I'm going to a boot pack meeting. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, I've been to a number of these meetings here over the last few months, or a couple months, and uh, I, I really have to applaud what this group does. Um, it, it's, it provides a, a, an opportunity, a soapbox, for each of the candidates that are running for any political office to um, come before you and share their messages. And it gives you an opportunity to vet them somewhat. Um, because as we hear, there's a lot of negativity going on out there right now. And the way I, I perceive that, I mean, I don't play that game. But what I, what I hear is noise. I mean, that's a lot of noise out there that it's a, that's oppressing all of the important stuff that we need to be talking about. Of how are we going to move this nation back into greatness? Because this nation right now is on a very slippery slope. We are so close to socialism that it's, it's unbelievable. My, Cuba might as well, you know, annex us. It's just getting unre it's getting to the point to where the definition of being American is no longer what it was when I was a kid, and I'm sure it's different than when you were a kid as well. So, a little bit about me, and then I'll get into. Um, some of the, my concepts relative to why I'm running, uh, what my platform is, how, why I think I can provide constructive change and improvement in, in the role of representation in Washington, D.C., and then open it up for Q&A, and you can ask me anything. So I'm a first-generation American. My dad came over in the 50s from Germany, uh, not a popular um, thing to be, 1950. Um, got to the United States, arriving in New York. At the age of 17, didn't have uh, but 20 bucks in his pocket, all by himself, and uh, didn't speak English. So he hitchhiked from New York to, to California, and he stopped off in Iowa for a few months. To, there was some family there. By the time he got to California, he spoke broken English. He pursued the American dream, you know, essentially getting three jobs, meeting an American woman, you know, having a family providing for his children better than he had for himself. I mean, you got to remember, this guy was dodging bombs in Nuremberg, you know, during when his youth. So I was raised in a, a very disciplined household. You can imagine the Germans, yeah? <laughs> you do this, you do that. So I spoke, I, I spoke, I speak both languages, um, which is great because, you know, I have roots. I know where my family comes from. I go back to Germany every year and, and, and visit with my cousins. Um, but, but it gives me an understanding of who I am and why I do the things I do. My grandmother was, is the matriarch. She still is alive. She's 94 years old, lived in her house now for over 55 years, drives a car on the 405 freeway in L.A. every day. God bless her and everybody's in her way. <laughs> Wonderful woman. I talk to her a lot, you know, because she is, you know, my my uh, my sounding board. She doesn't hear very much anymore, so sometimes I have to repeat it five times. So I, at least I get to rehearse what I'm going to say to her. Um, you know, but again, you know, she taught me as a kid, right from wrong. You know, the fork goes here, the knife goes there. Yes, sir. No, ma'am. Get your hands off or get your elbows off the table. First impressions are important. Never burn your bridges because you may have to use the bridge again. You know, just the basics. And, and we don't do a good job in, in America anymore about teaching the basics to kids. And, and, and it's, it's not really the government's responsibility. It's the family and the community's responsibility to do that. Because I'm not a federalist by any stretch of the imagination. But I'm a family guy. And I believe that families and communities need to pull together. And what you're doing here is, 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 is exemplary of what, what, what needs to happen is if the community comes together and says, this is how we want to move forward. So I grew up in Southern California under Governor Reagan, uh, which was really kind of cool back then. I didn't know any difference, and I didn't realize how cool it was. Um, I mean, it was in Southern California. You had people running around like John Wayne and you know, Audie Murphy and all these guys. It was a historical time looking back at it. Um, I even saw John Wayne when I was about this big, um, walking up to his boat, and I was like, well, the Duke. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Yeah, 
So, I mean, so it was very impressionable, right? But, but it gives you an idea of the influences I had as a kid. It was not a liberal influence. It was, again, a very hard work does pay off type of influence. So, fast forwarding a little bit. Um, at 18, I joined the Army. Uh, it was the right thing to do. Um, after World War II, my grandmother remarried uh, a, a first sergeant in the Army. And that was how she came over to the United States. And this first sergeant made sure I always had nice haircuts. There was usually nothing here or here, and very flat there. Um, and, 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 you know, I guess it was good for me, but again, that was the 60s, and that wasn't a popular haircut then either. Um, but this first sergeant really put a lot of uh, discipline in and the sense of honor, right, and that a man's word has value. And if you don't have value to your word, you're not a man. So, I mean, these are the kind of things that kind of drove me into military service at the age of 18. Um, I spent seven and a half years in the Army, uh, all of it in Germany. Uh, so I was essentially on the Czechoslovakia and East German border uh, flying a scout helicopter. Um, I loved it. It was a great time. Um, you know, I guess I have a lot of stories if you guys me after this. But some really funny stories, um, flying around castles and stuff like that, and under bridges, and chasing cattle. But, uh, you know, the thing was is that at that time, it was a Cold War, right? The job was to keep Ivan on the other side of the fence. And we had a lot of people coming in and out of, of our rotations, dignitaries. So we would have the Secretary of State come through. We would have uh, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs come through. And, and you know, inevitably, they'd end up in the back of my helicopter. And you know what? I, these people put their pants on one leg at a time, just like me. So at a very young age, I was impressioned that, hey, representation in government, in senior leadership, is by the people. These are just regular folk that had, some way or another, they got to this level. So, I mean, that, was, that, that really impressed me. I said, you know, if they can do it, I can do it. Well, one of the guys was Charlie Koshvili. I mean, have you, any of you familiar with Charlie Koshvili? Um, he was the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Chess Staff. I knew him as a colonel. And then he had eventually became a four-star. Um, I mean, watching this guy who was a Czechoslovakian immigrant to the United States and during World War II turn around and become the, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, that's just amazing. But at the end of my military career, and I would have been a, a, a lifer because um, I really liked it that much, I had an accident. Uh, I ended up spending six months in an Army hospital getting put back together, rotating through uh, Landstuhl and then ultimately Walter Reed. And... Uh, Unfortunately, I, 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 was, I was retired out. I couldn't, I couldn't do the runs anymore. I couldn't carry the packs. Um, now, when you say retired out, wow, really? Yes, sir. What manner of uh, helicopter transport Yeah, so you started out as a mechanic, then you go into crew chief, and then you go into technical observer, and then you become a technical inspector. Um, then I was running the, all the maintenance for all of the aircraft. What uh, platform? Oh, OH-58A. Which is the Kyle Bell 206? Uh, Our uh, 1980 to 1987. Absolutely. Uh, that's seven years in Germany. Seven years in Germany. How do I do that? I don't have any problem in Germany. This has me good taste. Yeah, it has me good taste. Yeah. So I mean, I had no problem living in Germany because it really tastes good. That's what I said. Um, and and it's, it's, again, I, gr I grew up speaking both languages, so it wasn't a problem. Uh, and I had more family there than I did in the United States. But, but fast forwarding, because I know you're not here about who I am, but I think character is kind of important in this race. Because we're seeing, cause we're seeing a, a lot of lack of character right now in the media, which I, is very disappointing. Um, so I, at that point, you know, I was still pretty young. And I, I had the decision of, am I going to work with my hands? which was my trade, or could I step up and start working with my brain a little bit more? Well, while I was in the military, I was parallel processing an undergraduate degree, which is my, my bachelor's of professional aeronautics. I wasn't done yet, you know, because it's essentially, you're doing your mission during the day. I had a young family, had a wife and kid, um, and then go to school, you know, on the base, on the weekends, at night, whenever I was allowed to. Uh, and by the way, they put me in a, in a big green tent for three months at a time, sometimes on a reforger or something like that, which is a return of forces to Germany. You know, it's a big maneuver. 
so i didn't have a consistent time but i was making it happen so when i came back to the united states i went right back into industry got a job as in aerospace and defense um i was working on internet intercontinental nuclear ballistic missiles so it was mx missiles we were doing the guidance systems i was in the clean room quality engineer i was on second and third shift and i would go to school during the day to finish my last semester when i finished my last semester of school um went right to make if this is in southern california so back in this time southern california was the industry in in all the united states for aerospace no longer the case um went then from there i went to make donald douglas got on a, a navy trainer program as a quality engineer quickly went up to branch manager uh when that program transferred over from development to production they offered me the opportunity almost anywhere in the company because of some successes we realized so i went to switzerland and uh I, what, tough duty right so i went to switzerland working on international procurement uh for mcdonald douglas for its commercial business uh essentially uh, working with 36 suppliers in 12 countries dealing with international trade issues import export regulatory issues with regards to airworthiness and safety um dealing with you know government officials and industry people so it was, a, it was balancing a lot of work it was a 24 7 job uh, i'm a high energy person always have been and th those kind of jobs appeal to me you know so I, I i did that for a number of years and one of these german companies said hey we, we like what you were doing we like for you to build a factory for us in wichita <laughs> i live in the alps you want to put me in wichita well you know the opportunity was there and I, I, I came back to the states i built a factory for this german company uh ground up and uh it, it was a, it was an aerospace company um I, I did it under contract and when my contract was up which was three and a half years i moved on to something else that's just the nature of our business uh from there i went to iowa for a short stint and then i ended up in washington dc um meanwhile i had pursued parallel process again a master's degree with uh, French University, which is a Quaker university. I received a master's in management. I also wrote a book at that time. It was a book relative to quality systems in our industry, because at this time, it was this thing called ISO 9000. Um, some of you might be familiar with it, but nobody knew how to apply it to our industry. Well, I had a good sense of it, because I was just working in Europe, where that's it was pretty predominant, and so I, I wrote a book about it. But Washington called, and they needed somebody with my expertise to head up their national audit program, and uh, which is the oversight of all the manufacturing facilities worldwide for the FAA. Well, that lasted about seven months before they made me the assist assistant division manager for production and airworthiness, which was the number two person in all of the FAA for production oversight. Not only production oversight, but the development of international policy with regards to uh, international treaties with different nations with regards to how are their airplanes or their engines or components are going to come in, how are ours going to go out to them. Um, it's also developing national policy for how are we going to engage with industry. It's working with industry and developing that policy. Uh, and then, of course, the oversight activities. Now, I went into that job with the, with the, the conscious decision that I was never going to become a bureaucrat. Now, but the thing is, is, is some of you are, are probably aware, aware if you want to be the best in your industry as a professional, you at some point need to be inside the beltway to understand how it works. So that was my, my objective, is to get some inside the beltway experience. My, my plan was five years. I lasted four until somebody put this big old worm on the end of the hook and says, hey, we'd like you to come be a vice president at one of our corporations. So um, Pratt & Whitney, how many of you are familiar with Pratt & Whitney? Most of you, not all. Pratt & Whitney is one of the world's largest manufacturers of engines, turbine engines. Um, they're on all kinds of platforms, whether it's helicopters, small airplanes, commercial airplanes, military airplanes, space shuttles, Delta rockets. We had it all. They, they brought me in as the vice president of quality and regulatory compliance, product integrity. Um, it's, so it's I was responsible for everybody else's job. You know, if something goes wrong, it's always quality's fault, right? Well, um, I was the youngest executive ever in that position, and ultimately, um, I lasted the longest in that position, even till today. Nobody's lasted as long as I did in that job, sir. I hate to cut you short. Yes, sir. I'd like to get, like to ask you a couple of questions about the current campaign. Would you mind if we move to you know, where we are right now? Okay, so 
let me let me stop where I'm at. Okay. So, okay. Well, I, I didn't know how much you guys wanted, knew about me or what, because it was a big deal. If you have very a very interesting background, and, and yes, okay. you did not know a lot about it, we certainly appreciate but we know where you're going now in terms of your ability and your background. Well, do you know I've been here for over almost 11 years in Lee County? I've been here. And, and that I, I've gone through hurricanes and lost my house to hurricane. And that uh, I've stood in line with, uh, waiting for the National Guard to give us ice and water. Which is one of my questions, if I may. Okay. Yeah. My first question. And, um, the question is, Southwest Florida has a lot of needs on the national level. Yep. You know, and a lot of those needs need to be met. And we need the representation there that we have not been getting in the past. Yep. And currently. Uh, what do you think those needs are and how do you think you'd be able to uh, help us best? Yeah, so picture three other candidates up here for the primary. Right. And, and I think this is probably one of the most distinguishing factors that, 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 that buy to me, is leadership and tenacity. I mean, there's, I, I, bar none, I don't believe there's, there's another candidate in here that has the, the passion that I do and has the intestinal fortitude to stand up to bullies. I, I have no fear. I have no fear whatsoever because I don't, those guys and gals that are in D.C. are not going to elect me. I'm not a member of the establishment. I'm getting no money from any PAC or third parties. That's for sure. All right? Period. I, folks, they're spending $150,000 a week on advertising. I haven't got that much in the whole campaign. Now, but, but the important thing is, is that it's not about the money. It's about the character and the integrity of the person who's going to represent you. And that person has to be able to speak on your behalf even when you're not there. So if you don't have the trust in the candidate, why even have a candidate? I mean, it's, 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 you're, it's, being, it's counterproductive. So, how, why do I think I'm also going to be more effective? Well, I have a plan. And, and, you know, we all hear about, oh, I got this great plan. Well, but the reality is, is that it's, it's got to be relevant. It's got to be tangible. It has to be measurable. And it has to be doable. All right? I have, I'm not naive to Washington. I've worked in that, that state or that, that district for a long time. I still do. I'm, I was just on the phone half the day yesterday with Washington on FAA matters, um, it, which I didn't get to what my day job is now. I'm still in aerospace and defense, and I'm still working in that area. Um, so, I, you know, my background is, is predominantly aerospace and defense, so I call my plan the C4 plan. Um, you know, it's essentially is the first C is every action I take must be measured against the Constitution. So, it, if we're passing a new law, go through a constitutional review. If it violates the Constitution, that, that law isn't going through. We need to rework it. If there's a law on the books that already exists and it violates the Constitution, it must be repealed or it must be modified so it does have consistency with the Constitution. Now, that's a, that's a, that's a principle. That's way up here, right? It doesn't have a lot of legs to it. So how do you put legs to that? Well, you have to get uh, a coalition built, right? And, and there's two types of coalitions you have to have in Washington. You have to have coalitions built on principles, and you have to have coalitions built on issues. Okay, on the principles issue, that's, a, that's pretty simple. I go to the, 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 the conservative caucus, and there's about 80 names on that caucus list, but there is not 80 conservatives on that list. And, and not having known any, all these individuals personally, I'm not taking that list for granted. I will definitely make sure to go through my own vetting process because the last thing I need to be is submarine by one of these guys or gals. So, and I have a pretty good judgment of, of character. And it doesn't take me a long time to figure out when somebody is BSing me. So I'll be able to take this as a, a, a road map of people that have already been identified and so already self-proclaimed themselves as conservatives on the principal side and figure out what that handful of people are that I can collaborate with and get something done. Now on the issues side, and this is going to go to like ACA and entitlement and stuff like that, is there's a lot of Democrats that are not happy with what's going on right now. And now is a great time to develop coalitions with Democrats that want change, right? So you work with them. You find the issues that you're common on. You jump over to the other side of that, that aisle. You know, you're not being a Benedict Arnold. You're collaborating for the better good of the people on a constitutionally valid topic. Right? So 
That's how you get things done in D.C. You don't say, I'm going to stick a, put a stick in your eye and, and now I don't want you to work with me. That's not how it works. Right? You, you get a lot more flies with some honey. Right? Um, so now, that's putting some legs to it. Now, to get some real traction, you got to get on the right committee. So, right? Now, my background is obviously, I have a, I have a, uh, an absolutely love for, for veterans. The veterans issues, 1% of our population are veterans. And so there's this veterans committee that I'd like to get on, and there's, there's one issue that I want us to re reverse, and this is this issue that's re recently occurred, it's called uh, uh, TRICARE Prime. And TRICARE Prime was, a, it's essentially it's a, it's a policy that the DOD provides its, its people. If you're not a veteran, you probably aren't aware of it, but it's really, Ruining a lot of veterans. Florida has the highest concentration of veterans in the entire country. This is a constituent issue. And I want to be able to rectify it for our veteran members. Another thing is that, you know, I've got this military background, so I definitely want to be on the Defense Appropriations Committee. Right? So there's, there, that's about 20% of our GDP. And, and, well, you know, just recently the Secretary of the Navy called me up to the Pentagon. I spent six months up in the Pentagon working on acquisition reform issues. I know where the skeletons are. I know what needs to be done. The problem is, is that once you get done with one of these studies, you know where it goes? Right, in, yeah, right into the drawer that never gets pulled out again. I know where all these studies are. We don't need any more studies. We need some action. Now, on this entitlement stuff, food stamps, $93.8 billion a year. Holy moly! You know what that is? That is an addiction. We get our people addicted to this heroin called entitlement. Okay, and it, it, it's, it's bad because it's it, it's a death spiral. We take all of the incentive for self-reliance out of our people. We need to get people self-reliant again. And guess what? Our revenue is going to go up because they're contributing as opposed to being leeches. So, what committee would I want to get on? The Ways and Means Committee. Right. One more. I'm going to finish my, my last committee. Okay, because I'm going to get my fourth C, too. I got four. I got Okay. So, so um, the last committee is, is the Transportation Committee. You know, I'm an aerospace and defense expert. I deal with, with transportation every day. I provide value on day one on that one. Uh, I know the NTSB, the TSA, the FAA. Um, I, I, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a no-brainer. Now, the most important C constituency outreach, right? This is you all. This is us all. Because what happens is we get representatives. Historically, this is very true to District 19. We get representatives voted in, and you never see them again. Your voice becomes silent. You don't know who's working on your behalf because you never see them. So what I want to do in my plan is to have four town halls every year at a minimum. It's a round table type work in the town hall. So it's essentially, and why four? Well, this district is huge, from Marco Island to Boquilla, right? And there's no expectation that somebody from Marco Island is going to go all the way to Boquilla, where I live, to, 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 to go to a town hall. So we need to make sure that they're, they're revolving and have the door open to all constituents. And that it's a two way dialogue, not a one way dialogue. So, that is a tangible plan, and it's not naive to think that a freshman congressman can do that. It would be naive to say, I'm going in with this huge budget plan, and I think it's going to get passed on day three. That ain't going to happen. We haven't passed a budget in this country in years. Right. So, sir, you had another question. Uh, yes, and you brought it up, the fact military. Frankly, I'm pissed off. <laughs> I hope so. Frankly, I'm pissed off. Right. What do you plan on doing about it? Well, uh, yeah, I'm going to use one of my, some of my C's, mm -hmm. right? I'm going to make sure I've got coalition set up that they can have to have my back. Because um, you never go into a firing squad without having some support, right? And then you get, you get on the right committees. But, but the, the truth of the matter is you've got to talk with data. You know, and the data shows that every time we reduce our strength, something bad happens. 
And, and the last time that we reduced our strength, actually, our, our military budget was on its normal track of incline all the way up until we got Obama. I'm not Obama. Dang, I wish we did. Osama bin Laden. Freudian <laughs> slip. Until we got Osama bin Laden. <laughs> and I'm taping this too, so I, you got me. But the, the month we got him, our budget goes down like this. So what have we seen since then? We've seen Syria. We've had we've seen the Arab Spring, right? We 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 see now this this in Ukraine. We've lost all credibility. Okay, we earn our credibility through a psychology that we're the strongest in the world, and that when we put a line in the sand, that line has meaning. Okay. When somebody crosses it, and then we say, oh, well, here's another one. We have just lost all respect. Now, I've spent a lot of time in the sandbox. Now, I've spent a lot of time in the Middle East. They do not think like we do. They respect strength. We cannot even for one minute allow ourselves to be in the same position of saying a reasonable person would think differently. They, their, their, their measure of reasonable is different. And it's, it's just a psychology. It's not good or bad. They're from a different part of the world. Okay, so their measurement of good and bad is a different standard than ours. So we owe it to our people, the citizens of the United States, to have the most powerful military in the world. And it's going to cost us GDP. But we have to do it, otherwise we will not be speaking English. We'll be speaking Chinese. We'll Russian will be speaking something other than this. Sir? You had indicated that uh, you talked about the food stamp program being bloated or, or hyperinflated. Isn't it true that uh, returning veterans uh, make up the largest proportion of growth in recent years in the food stamp program? And if so, how can you cut that program or cut it back without attaching one of your other uh, support points, which was support for veterans? Yeah, I, 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 I disagree.